Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Christopher Chung. I have the privilege of addressing you all for this coffee and conversations this morning. So thank you all for your hospitality. Uh, I've got a couple of objectives that I want to cover in the next 15 to 20 minutes. But I really, after that, I'd like to leave as much time as possible for questions. Uh, anytime I get the privilege of speaking to audiences like this, it's actually much more fun for me to hear what's on your mind and the kinds of things that you would like to learn a little bit more about. But I always feel it's helpful just to provide a little bit of a level set uh, before that happens. Uh, a couple of quick introductions before I get uh, started. I've got a couple of my colleagues here today. Uh, I'll introduce their respective roles a little bit uh, later on in the presentation so you've got some context. But I got Monica Molina, she's part of our small business advisors team and then Savannah Walker from our business development team. I, anytime I go on the road speaking to different groups, I pretty much give an open invitation uh, to my colleagues to join me if they're interested, because one, it helps them hear what we're talking about when we discuss the work of our organization, but two, more importantly, it helps them see what are, the, what are the issues and questions on the minds of the different audiences that we get the chance to engage with every day. Uh, another shout out to Fred Havasey. Uh, if the Fred is with Havasey Homes, Keller Williams. Fred was my realtor, or our realtor, I should say, when we bought our home back in 2017 in Raleigh. So it's the first time I've seen Fred in a number of years now, but he gave us uh, fantastic service, and we're still very grateful, still in that home, and now have two daughters who are growing up uh, in that home that we did not have before. Uh, so again, uh, Christopher Chung is my name. I've been in my role for nearly 10 years as head of an organization called the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, EDPMC for short. I will explain a bit more about what that uh, organization does in a little bit. Just by way of my own background, I've been in the economic development field for, uh, I guess this is September now, so 27 years ago is when I started in this line of work with a college internship for the state of Ohio's economic development agency. I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, one of 200,000 native-born Ohioans who now call North Carolina home but started my professional journey 27 years ago with the state of Ohio, had a stint with the state of Missouri for seven years, and then moved here just under 10 years ago to begin the role that I am now, which is to lead this organization called the EPNC. A couple of objectives uh, that I hope you will take away from this. We are, in case you haven't noticed, it is election season, so federal and state, and usually in election season, you're gonna hear the words economic development or job creation come up quite often because both sides want you, the voters, to know how good of a job they have done when it comes to growing an economy, attracting jobs, 
If you don't know what economic development is or everything that goes into it, I hope that at a minimum you walk away from this with a better understanding of what economic development looks like, at least here in the state of North Carolina. The other objective is how this ties into your business of real estate. Hopefully, by the time this presentation is over, you have a better sense of how, if we are successful as a state when it comes to economic development, that's ultimately a really, really good thing for industries like yours because it just stimulates even more activity and demand for the very services and products that you guys are out there working in the market every day. Um, so with that, you had a question, and then, but if you've got one right now, I'm happy to take it. Otherwise, I'll sort of go ahead and look. Yeah, sure. The PVPMC, is that a trade group or is that a government agency? I'll explain it here in a second. Yeah, it's all, it's all part of the standard 15, 20 minutes that I'll offer as a level set, and then the rest of the time, by all means, fire away with whatever questions spark your mind. As I said, EDPNC, the organization itself is about a decade old. So next month we'll celebrate our 10th anniversary. I had the privilege of serving essentially as the first full-time CEO for the organization. Uh, to answer the first question, we are not a government agency, but we're also not a private business. We are uh, a nonprofit, and more commonly we're known as what's called a public-private partnership. That's just a fancy way of saying that we've got both public and private resources that we depend on to do our work. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so any of you who serve with or volunteer, that's, that's a very common structure for nonprofits. More importantly is the work that we do on behalf of the state, we are a contractor, ultimately, to the state of North Carolina to do this work on their behalf. The much more important part and the much more interesting part is what is that stuff that we get to do on behalf of the state of North Carolina? And that's where I'm gonna get into what makes up economic development, at least at a state level here in North Carolina. When we were created 10 years ago, we were created with essentially the same set of responsibilities that we still have to this day. Our mission is also the same. Our, our mission is probably the best place to begin. For us, our mission is to improve the economic well-being and quality of life for the 10.8 million and counting people who live in North Carolina today. I always like to describe the audiences like this. If we are doing our jobs well, Monica and Savannah are doing their jobs well, at the end of every day, the economic opportunity that the average North Carolinian has is a little bit more and a little bit better than at the beginning of the day when we started our work. It's, it's as simple as that. But how do we go about approaching such an abstract mission as that? That's where we get in that very specific set of responsibilities that the EDPNC is in charge of executing every single day. I always like to rattle them off in the same order, but if you're taking notes, this is what economic development looks like from a day-to-day -day on the ground level in North Carolina, because that is what we, as the state's economic development organization, are tasked with. You probably, if you've ever heard of us before today, chances are you probably came across our name in something like a Triangle Business Journal article maybe occasionally WRAL TechWire, or even sometimes News and Observer, but it's almost always around the context of the first of those five responsibilities, which is business recruitment. Business recruitment is where every day we get the chance to interact with companies that are thinking about where their future growth is going yeah. to happen. Maybe it's a manufacturer, maybe it's a life sciences firm, maybe it's a technology company, but they are thinking about where can we expand and locate so that we as a company can continue to grow. And we are on the other side of that conversation trying to convince those companies to do that in North Carolina. In other words, we're trying to recruit companies in from outside the state who are not here today. And the kinds of companies that we get to deal with span just about every imaginable industry sector that's out there. Like I said, life sciences, tech, automotive, aerospace, financial services, those are some of the industries that make up the kinds of companies that we're in conversation with every day, making the case that if they're going to grow and expand, North Carolina is the best possible location for them. And we're, of course, in the process of those conversations, we're talking about the quality and quantity of our workforce that a company can take advantage of. We're talking about our tax rates. We're talking about our business-friendly regulations or our location or our infrastructure. We might be talking about quality of life. We might be talking about energy costs. Anything and everything, put yourself in the position of a business that is thinking about where they're going to expand and locate in the future. It's actually not all that different from how individuals approach real estate decisions. They have a list of must-haves and they have a list of nice-to-haves. 
And our job is to paint the best possible picture of North Carolina. So they walk away from that conversation thinking, I would be foolish if we didn't put our company in North Carolina. That's the work we get to do every day on the business recruitment front. And it's usually where audiences like this tend to have the most questions. But like I said, I don't want to shortchange everything else that we get to do under the banner of economic development. That, that's what I'll touch here in a second. But as you can imagine, if we're successful with attracting companies in from outside the state, the amount of job creation and investment that come along with that creates enormous demand for things like homes and real estate. It's part of why economic development and re residential real estate are inextricably linked. Uh, to give you some example of some of the success North Carolina has had in business attraction, just over the past four and a half years, there's been about just under about 700 companies that have announced new locations or expansions all across North Carolina to the tune of more than 90,000 announced new jobs and 50 billion with a B in announced new investment. That's the kind of impact. Now, we're not the only group that deserves credit. By far, that's far from the truth. We are part of a larger team that's working at a state, regional, local, public and private level to try to get these kinds of results. But the results are what they are and they're very impressive for North Carolina. It's something that all of us as North Carolinians should be very proud of because that's an enormous infusion of economic activity that's coming primarily from companies that are setting up operations here from outside the state, maybe in some cases expanding existing operations that they have. But as I said, business recruitment, that tends to be where we get the most attention for our work as an organization, but it's not the only way that we try to tackle that mission that I talked about at the very beginning. There are four other very important things that we do that are designed to drive economic development and growth in our state, that are designed to improve that economic well-being and quality of life for those 10.8 million people in this state home. So business recruitment is one. As important as it is for us to attract companies in from outside North Carolina, we can't forget about the, the firms that are already here today. So we have a team that's focused on what we call existing industry support. That is basically working with a lot of businesses that are already here, primarily in the manufacturing space. Uh, it's not enough time to get into all that details, but a lot of the tools that we have at our disposal as a state economic development organization do tend to favor firms in manufacturing, for example. So when you hear us talk about some of our work, you'll, you'll see that there's quite a bit of skewing towards that industry sector. But as I said, we have a team that's based around North Carolina, and their job every day is to sit down with existing companies, oftentimes manufacturers, sit across the table for them and say, okay, what's keeping you up at night? What challenges do you have that might be holding your company back from continuing to expand and add jobs in North Carolina? And our job, when we hear that, is to figure out how do we remove those barriers? How do we make it easier for those companies to keep expanding and growing here? Because guess what? There are far more companies that are already here in North Carolina today than the number of companies we could ever hope to recruit in from outside the state. So if we do a good job, or heck, even just a decent job, of tending to the needs of the firms that are already in North Carolina, that itself should hopefully yield a lot of job creation and expansion. It's, it's no different than the, the analogy of taking care of your existing customers. Like it's great to go out there and bring new customers in the door, but if you forget about or don't take care of your existing customers, you're probably not gonna have a really successful business at the end of the day. It's really not all that different when we talk about it in economic development terms. So that's why we have a team that's focused on tending to the needs of firms that are already here. We don't have to woo them. We don't have to wine and dine a lot of these companies. They're already here for a reason. We don't have to convince them that North Carolina is great. They know that, it's why they're here. But what we do have to do is make sure that we're addressing any hurdles that make it harder for that company to keep growing, keep adding jobs, and keep investing in the state. So that's function number two. Function number three is what we call international trade or export assistance. What we're doing in that case is we are helping a lot of smaller and medium-sized manufacturers figure out how to grow globally through exporting more of their products outside the United States. We live in the biggest economy in the world, but we always remind our export clients that the United States represents only 5% of the world's population and about 25% of the world's purchasing power. So if you're a company with a product 
there's tremendous opportunity sitting outside the United States. You don't even have to go very far. It could be Canada, Mexico, it could be Central America, but if you want to go to Middle East or Asia or Africa or Europe, there's a lot of market opportunity for you, and our team that does export assistance is there to help those companies figure out, are they ready to export? If so, which parts of the world make the best sense for them to sell into? And then finally, how do we help them enter those markets successfully so that they can sell more of their products to people in Europe or Asia or somewhere else? Why is that economic development? If a company here in North Carolina that makes a product is able to develop new customers and more demand outside the United States, what do they have to do if they, are, if they start selling a bunch more of their product overseas? Well, they're likely to have to expand their capacity back here in North Carolina to meet that new demand. That's why you see economic development functions at a state level like ours oftentimes include export assistance. It's an important part of our work that doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's very impactful for the businesses that we're able to assist because most companies, they wanna be global players, right? I mean, most companies have ambitious visions and a great way to be ambitious is to think about how your product can now be sold all around the world. And we're trying to help some of those firms do that from here in North Carolina. The fourth function that we talk about is the one that Monica is part of. It's our small business advisory team. This is a team of individuals who every day are either on the phone or emailing with or otherwise assisting individuals who are thinking about starting a brand new business somewhere here in North Carolina. That's the vast majority of the cases that the team is assisting. I, I don't know if any of you set up your own firms when you got into real estate, but the first time you did that, it was probably very daunting if you didn't have someone coaching you through that. Maybe you jumped on Google and you were just overwhelmed at all the information. You didn't know which ones to believe. Monica and her colleagues are trying to make that very intimidating <coughs> process a lot easier with that kind of human to human interaction every day with folks who are starting all different kinds of businesses. And Monica can tell you, we, we get some really fascinating business ideas that folks are launching. Now, sometimes it's like a, a landscaping business. Maybe it's a home health care business. Maybe they want to start like a coffee shop on their main street. We also get some really creative ideas from these folks who woke up that day and decided today is the day I'm going to start learning what I need to do to start this business in North Carolina. Monica and her team are providing an invaluable service, helping those folks with those initial steps of what's required. And we, of course, can refer them to a lot of other services like financing or or business plan development, or marketing assistance, just anything that can help that person eventually take that idea and turn it into a successful business. But we hope that we're being very impactful in those first few moments that that, comp that individual decides to start uh, his or her business in our state. Last but not least, if I talk about business recruitment, so attracting companies in from outside the state, talked about supporting the growth of existing firms who are already here. I talked about helping our manufacturers to sell more of their products around the world. And I talked about helping individuals realize their dreams of starting a brand new business. Last but not least is tourism promotion. That is a very, also an important role that we get to play at the EDPMC. We are the state's tourism marketing arm, for lack of better words. In other words, we are out every day promoting North Carolina as a leisure, travel, or vacation destination. You, will, you are unlikely to see most of that marketing effort because we're not really targeting folks who already live in North Carolina. I mean, like, no offense, but you're, you're not the target audience because hopefully if you've lived here long enough, you already know it's a beautiful state with 322 miles of Atlantic Ocean coastline and the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Smoky Mountains and golf and moonshine distilleries and craft beer and all the great things that there are to do. We are targeting people in D.C., New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, Atlanta, folks like that who may have a vaguer conception of everything there is to do in North Carolina. And we're doing it with the intent of getting those folks to come here and visit North Carolina to stay in our motels and hotels, to stay in our Airbnbs or Verbos, to spend money on local restaurants, spending money at gas stations, doing everything that you do, right, when you're traveling somewhere. If we can get those dollars coming into North Carolina instead of going to Florida or New York, that has an, a huge impact. North Carolina, in 2023, we saw visitor spending of approximately $36 billion all across the state. 98 of our 100 counties saw 
essentially record levels of visitor spending uh, in 2023. And that has tremendous impact because all that spending oftentimes is going into the pockets of the small businesses and workers who make up the tourism, leisure, and hospitality economy. In fact, in places like the Outer Banks or the mountains of our state, <coughs> that's not necessarily the kinds of places that are going to attract a thousand job factory, but they do see a lot of economic impact from tourism spending. I mean, just go visit the Outer Banks 4th of July weekend, and you can see the license plates and all the people who are coming there from the Northeast or the Northwest spending their money in North Carolina in a way that benefits the many businesses and people who make up the tourism economy for us. We have a couple other niche functions within the tourism team, so things like attracting retirees, or promoting North Carolina as a location for film and TV production. Those are all part of the broader tourism focus that we have as an organization. But we just essentially, for shorthand, we talk about our work in terms of tourism marketing. So those five things, tourism promotion, small business counseling, international trade assistance, supporting the growth of existing companies, and of course, recruiting firms in and from outside the state. Those are the things that the EEPNC gets to go out there and do every day on behalf of the people of North Carolina. We do it as a nonprofit organization that contracts with the state government of North Carolina to do this work. We get most of our funding from the state through the contract, but like a nonprofit, we're also able to fundraise dollars from the private sector, banks, utilities, construction firms, real estate developers, major associations like the North Carolina Realtors. These are some of the many groups that provide us funding on an annual basis that essentially allow us to expand the impact of our work. And we're very grateful for that additional support because it allows us to do more of what we are asked by the state to do. So that's the, that's the normal setup. So hopefully at a minimum, you walk away from today with at least a clear understanding of when people talk about economic development, at least in the state of North Carolina, what are some of the key things that go into that? Well, it's things like attracting more leisure travelers here to spend their money. It's things like attracting the jobs and investment of a company that's not here today, but that may be setting up operations. It's helping entrepreneurs get a promising start to the small business that they want to create. All of that eventually feeds into economic growth and development. And hopefully it's very apparent how that ties back into the work that you all do in the real estate industry. Because if we don't have that kind of demand and investment and job creation, it's probably not going to be a very fun time to be in something like residential real estate, for example. And so the work that we're doing hopefully has a positive impact on what you're all doing. But I'll pause there and let you all answer whatever, or ask whatever questions you have. I think we've got 20 some minutes. And I'd rather hear what's on your mind now that you've had a bit of a little level set on what we try to do at a state level. So with that, I'll, I'll throw it open to what I know is not a bashful group of folks. And I always ask questions. Sure. It's, it's a great thing you know, to compete you know, against Japan, China, India, or in any other country, right? Why is it a great idea like, to compete you know, with other states? Is it not a race to the bottom? You know, I mean, do we want like you know, 20 million people in North Carolina that depends on who you ask. Do you, yeah. do you get that question? Uh, yes, I, I think if there is, so having been in this line of work for more than a quarter century now, that's a very fair question to ask, right? Is what is, like, how, it depends on how you define success. For some people, growth is a, is a very reasonable success metric because the opposite, which is shrinking, that's not really a great place to be. I mean, go visit parts of, northeastern North Carolina or rural parts of the United States that are just seeing a very vicious circle where young people leave because there's no jobs and then companies won't go there because there's no people to hire. Like that's a really bad track to get on. And unfortunately that's, that's really affecting. Now the opposite is can there be such a thing as too much growth? And I'd say most people will say at a certain point, yeah, there probably is, but what is that point, right? Is it 15 million? Is it 20 million? Is it 12 million? It's going to vary depending on who you ask. Right. Yeah, I mean, I used to live in Wisconsin like 10 years ago, and there was an you know, Foxconn in the news mm -hmm. and all over the place. Sure. Yeah. And if they were just trying to cut taxes, cut, 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 and cut, I mean, you move all the Northeasterners, you know, to this beautiful state, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, great weather and stuff, 
why can't you know Georgia do that? You know, do us or like you know uh, Texas do that? You know, for us, you know, for us, right? I mean, they you know take all the business. Is there some national you know consortium just like you do? You know, for North Carolina, do all of you guys you know sit together you know as like a national group and give it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I see my peers quite often. We, we meet on a usually twice a year to talk about common issues that we're dealing with. Uh, yes, I, I think your question seems to be getting to the role of like tax policy and incentives, and if we're all just bidding on the same thing, does that kind of lead to the, the lowest common denominator? And that's a very fair criticism of the economic development industry. What I'll say is that's not the only way we're trying to get companies to come here. We're, we're oftentimes not going to be the most advantageous from an incentive package standpoint, but we know that's because we have a whole lot of other things that businesses are attracted to. And I think businesses don't just decide based on who has the biggest incentive package. Uh, price certainly matters, but they also have to look at what's my prospects for hiring the kind of workforce that I need. What's the physical infrastructure environment look like in the state? Like if you are falling down on some of those other merits of a decision, no amount of incentives can usually make up that ground, right? There's plenty of states that can put a much bigger package on the table than North Carolina, but if they're lagging, as they often are, in some of the other business fundamentals that a company cares about, we're okay, but you know, that's, that's usually gonna work out to our benefit. So yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure I see it play out as often as maybe some people might perceive. So you have non-disclosure, non-disclosure you know, things, you know, things you can't talk about. Of course, yeah. In, in, a, in, a, in a setting like this? Yeah, of course, yeah. Because, you know, Apple was going to open, you know, their doors. Oh, did people can hear yeah, me? Yeah, okay. I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I was just talking about non-disclosure because it would be great, you know, for this group to know Who's the next largest company who's going to move here? <laughs> and we, we could all buy, you know, Chris's lunch for the next three months. You know? no, I mean, you can imagine why companies. It's, it's not. Yeah, uh, I, I get it. You know, that that was, you know, that was a cheeky, you know, yeah. Uh, but really, like, you know, material stuff, right? Uh, Apple, you know, they were supposed to, like, you know, you know, groundbreak last year, and I heard, you know, Google bought some land. Any comments about that? And one last question before you know, I let everybody else you know, jump on the questions. Uh, what about the the low speed train or you know whatever the transit system, the train? There was there was some talk about like you know uh, a train system light rail, yeah, 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 light rail. So these three questions, and then I shut up. Uh, I'm not sure where, as far as I know, I don't, I don't think there's been any movement on light rail. And of course, light rail, the, the issue that any city who wants to adopt light rail is the cost. It's very, very expensive. So unless the federal government is able to provide a lot of funding, and the state usually has to provide funding, and I don't think necessarily those two things are there right now. Um, for the Apple and Google, I mean, I think those companies have been very public about what their plans are, so I, there's probably nothing I can say that would add more color to what they've publicly declared already. Uh, I can't remember, there was a third question in there somewhere. Uh, yeah, are they coming or really? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think Apple, I, I don't think it's a secret that Apple continues to hire people, so what they have essentially pushed the timetable back on is the construction of a physical campus, but they're very committed to the workforce that they have managed to acquire here because they see that as a, they see the workforce in this region as a competitive advantage and that is why they have a presence here. It's not the presence that they perhaps thought they would by this point, but I'm not really concerned about when that happens or I'm not concerned about the if, it's, it's a matter of when. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so much. Yep, absolutely. Um, so Meta announced a big 800, oh, I'm sorry. Meta announced a $800 million data center down in South Carolina last week, and so I was just asking how any of those conversations, obviously we have a good data center presence here in the state already, how are those conversations going? Yeah, so data centers are really interesting. Does anyone know what a data center is? I mean, picture a giant warehouse looking building with a bunch of computer equipment, I and mean, that's the simplest way to describe it. But they are very power intensive, and as we were actually just talking with Monica this morning about using ChatGPT, as things like ChatGPT and generative AI consume more and more of our daily lives, to set up the kinds of data centers that power generative AI, you are talking about a, um, you, you don't just need the land, you need immense power infrastructure to, to provide the electricity to run these data centers. 
and what has started to happen in the past couple of years, and this, this I, you know, we, of course we talk about this when we get together as state peers. The, there's been a, a pretty big wave of investment happening in the United States over the past four, four and a half years. When I, when I shared those numbers, for example, so almost 700 announcements in North Carolina, 90,000 jobs, a lot of that has actually been manufacturing investment that has been announced in North Carolina. Uh, take uh, what Toyota's doing out in uh, just south of Greensboro in Randolph County. If you're familiar with that, I hope you are because that's 5,100 jobs that Toyota itself will be creating at a $14 billion factory that is producing batteries for hybrid vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and electric vehicles. You see Wolf Speed down in Siler City, which if you drive 64 west, Past Jordan Lake, you'll eventually see this massive looking structure that Wolf Speed is constructing, a $5 billion factory that'll be about 2,000 jobs making essentially semiconductor materials that also happen to be going into the electric vehicle industry. Go out to Asheville along I-26, you'll see a big factory off to the east, that's Pratt and Whitney, which is already operating, making sophisticated components for aircraft engines. Pratt & Whitney is one of the three biggest aircraft engine makers in the world. That's a factory that was announced a few years ago that's been operational for a couple of years now. There's been a major resurgence of American manufacturing, which I, I think is good, right? We're all Americans, that's, that's a great thing. It's been spurred in part by some of the stuff that has come out of Washington, D.C., which is basically federal support and sweeteners for certain industry sectors to bring manufacturing back to the United States, whether that's semiconductor production, whether that's producing things like hybrid and electric vehicles and all this stuff that goes into it. Again, one can debate the politics of whether or not that makes sense or if that's good policy. It doesn't matter to us at a state level. If it's being done at a federal level, it means that companies are now spurred to make these investments in the United States. And while that's good for the country, we want it to be good for North Carolina as well. So all that to get back to your question is, all this new manufacturing that North Carolina and other states has attracted, those are also very power intensive industries. And what that has done in the short term is it's really kind of reduced the number of options for companies that are looking for a site that requires massive amounts of power. So with Meta in South Carolina, I don't remember if they looked here, it's, it's, it's quite likely they did. So it may have been a question of could they find a site that had the power infrastructure for their timetable here, or was the one in South Carolina or somewhere else, was it just available on a regular basis? We, we regularly get looked at for those kinds of projects. The challenge that's emerged now for the past couple of years for us though is the number of locations where that kind of project can go due to the very immense power infrastructure requirements it's just fewer because a lot of our prime sites with power infrastructure have been consumed by these other manufacturing plants that have also located in the state. It's a very real challenge that economic developers, not just here in this state, but a lot of states are dealing with that will also attract a lot of manufacturing. It's basically all your prime manufacturing real estate, if that's off the market now, the next time a company comes looking around, what are you putting in front of that firm so that you have a reasonable chance to get them to locate? Again, some you all understand that the, the quandary of not having enough product or inventory on the residential side, we are starting to see some of that play out on the industrial side. And it, it's really based on some of the success that we've had as a state attracting other investment here in the past few years. Yes, uh, next row. Yeah. Oh, uh, I thought the lady here was yeah. first, but I guess she's first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think all of us can see the ways that we can benefit directly, right, from the growth that you and your team have done. What are ways or what are things that we can do as realtors or North Carolina residents to help support you and your team? That's a good question. Um, well, I already mentioned that the North Carolina Realtors is one of those organizations that supports our work financially, uh, our nonprofit, which we really appreciate. But I'd say beyond that, I mean, your, your role as a, a resident or a citizen is, is I think, being a, being a booster for North Carolina, right? I mean, you, you all live here, you work here, whether you've been here your whole life or whether you're like me and moved here at some point, hopefully you all feel like this is a great place to work, play, do business, live. You can be really great ambassadors for North Carolina. I mean, you'd be amazed at how often when, when, especially when we're trying to talk to companies and convince them to locate in North Carolina. Ultimately, 
for a lot of these companies, they, they want to know that they're going to be welcome, and they want to know that they're going to a place that their employees will be excited about moving to, or that they know they can recruit talent from outside that, that's not going to say, oh, North Carolina, why would I ever want to move there for, for the job that you're offering? They, they want to be assured that this is the case. And the, the, the best way that they can really get assured about that is when they talk to other people who have made that same move or have that same experience of having brought their families here or come here for school and never thought they would stay after they graduated but decided to stick around because the economy was good or they love the quality of life. Like those kinds of personal testimonials, you'd be amazed at how often those can be very relevant, even on decisions that involve like billions of dollars. You would think it'd be like much more objective, but remember it's human beings that are making this decision at the end of the day. They're trying to decide where is the best place for my company to stake its future growth. And I would say that in North Carolina, um, you all have that chance to just, in the, the course of your daily work, whether it's on social media or whether you're traveling to a conference nationally or you're taking a personal trip overseas, just remember every time you leave your house, you get the chance to be an ambassador for how great North Carolina is, or if you just want to dial it back, how great the Triangle region is, or how great Raleigh is. Like each of you has that opportunity, and, and I hope you will do it out of genuine interest. Like if you generally don't like don't don't like North Carolina, then you know, I'm not asking to be an ambassador for us. Like, you probably need to find like South Carolina or somewhere else that you want to live. But I, I suspect most people in North Carolina. The reason we've grown as a state is people move here and they find out this is a really great place to live and they stay, and that's been a big part of our success. But to get back to your question, that, that's probably the biggest thing that anyone in North Carolina can do is just continue to beat the drum for how great of a place this is. Do you mind if I just Yeah, go, yeah please go ahead, that. Monica. So one of the reasons I wanted to come to this event is because it's shameless plug for the small business advisors. A lot of times you're one of the first points of entry for people that are moving to the area with a primary breadwinner that's just gotten a, you know this great new job and you know come with this new company and so many of those folks are calling us because they want to start their side hustle or their dream business or take it from a hobby to um, an income producer and you're the first person they're gonna voice that to you know they need that extra bonus room for their office or whatever if you could just let them know we are here and that we can help them because a lot of those guys get caught up with uh, or other those folks get caught up with um, for-profit businesses that want to charge them for the services that we provide to them at no cost. North Carolina pays for us, the Small Business Center Network. There is a lot that they can do um, without paying for it. And so we just have brought some business cards, a couple of bookmarks. Would love for y'all to just let them know Small Business Advisors are here and, and we'd love to help them. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Appreciate you making that point. Um, so I would like to pick you up on your offer because um, we are, uh, you know, with a theme of sustainability, uh, we are working on launching a global digital virtual currency, first one of its kind, that would be backed by green real estate. And uh, we already have some assets in North Carolina, and we want to expand globally as well to your mission that you know, we have opportunity all over around the planet. So far, this project has been funded by out of pocket from volunteers, and you know, like-minded people. And I believe to take it to the next level, um, my question is, even though we have been promised a federal grant, but while we are waiting for that, it doesn't come in our hands so far, what is it that we can get from you, uh, besides in terms of guidance and mentoring, can you help us with securing some funding or, or loan for that matter? Is yeah. there any vehicle like that? Uh, I would have to understand the details a little bit more. Like, we yes. don't have grant programs that we provide, but we have one, but it goes to communities specifically for developing industrial real estate. Okay. Um, we are certainly well aware of a lot of different groups that may have something. It, it can be challenging. I, I'll be upfront that to secure state, federal, or other public funding for right. new, like, startup type ventures is usually like the riskiest part. And, and that's because these are taxpayer dollars at the end of the day. <laughs> taxpayer dollars if you put those in very high risk situations, which many startups tend to represent, that's not always something that uh, ends up well. And so I'll just be upfront, but there may be something out there. Again, I, I, I would need to understand the particulars a little yeah. bit more about so that. So what would be the contact point? Well, we can talk afterwards. I'll, okay. I'll be able to stick around for a few minutes. So we Thank can you. talk about that offline, yeah. Uh, I think 
there was one here and then one here. from various businesses that come here for job interview. They want a tour of the area, the region. Uh, so what do you see as far as businesses uh, in the Triangle area in the next, say, year or two that we could navigate the conversation? Are things that maybe are under the radar that we haven't heard? Uh, I'm not sure. I, it's, I, you're, you're asking like what, uh, where we anticipate, like the kinds of companies that we expect would locate here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. That we can talk to and share, you know, publicly. What kinds of businesses are coming, or what new moves we can announce? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've never announced anything. Yeah. I wasn't asking about Apple, but that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 What could you get money? That Yes, um, so I think one area of success that this region has continued to have, and this shouldn't be any surprise to any of you who follow the business news, is the life science industry writ large has been a, a major driver of economic development activity. When we talk about company expansions and company locations, uh, you go down to Johnston County and Novo Nordisk, which <coughs> has making a, a, a fair, doing really well because of all the interest in uh, I think we go to you know, Zempic are the ones that Nova Nordisk supplies uh, for. Uh, there's also Manjaro. There's just a, these um, kind of uh, diabetes medicines that now have weight loss implications. It's just that's a gangbuster segment of the pharma industry. Um, so Johnson, Nova Nordisk put $4 billion to expand their factory down in Clayton to meet some of this new demand. Uh, Wilson uh, landed Schott, which is a German company. They make the glass needle that goes into the auto injector pump. If you are on Ozempic or something, I, I think it's I think you like inject yourself with it every couple, couple times a week or something like that. So that's a supply chain component that goes into that. Nipro Medical over in Greenville, <laughs> Japanese company, they make another component of that auto injector pump that has applications in things like uh, Ozempic. So just those three examples of major investments that have happened and been announced in the past six months within the triangle and the broader region to show you that pharmaceuticals and the life science industry writ large it is clearly one of the strengths that this area is known for. We get, that's uh, life science projects are probably about 10% of our deal pipeline right now. Um, most of those are probably looking generally in the triangle region. And if we can win some of those, that's going to be additional new jobs and investment that come from that sector. Uh, I wish office, I, I was telling someone this morning before the pandemic, um, we also, uh, like what you've heard me talk about in the past four years, some of the successes, those have largely been like manufacturing projects, whether that's Pratt & Whitney or Toyota or Schott or Nipro, that's, that's essentially industrial real estate where someone is making a product. Before the pandemic, a lot of what we also competed for though were office deals. This was where someone like Take Honeywell, which moved its global headquarters from New Jersey to Charlotte back in 2018, or Advanced Auto Parts, which moved its corporate headquarters from Roanoke, Virginia to Raleigh back in 2019. Uh, Apple, those conversations started pre-pandemic. Um, I guess they announced in the pandemic, that's an office project as well. But we saw a lot of those kinds of situations where we were competing for employers that would be bringing employees into an office every day to do some kind of work, either in technology or headquarters or finance or something like that versus manufacturing. Since the pandemic, no surprise, just all the trends in remote and hybrid, that's really pretty much knocked all of those kinds of opportunities out of our pipeline and, and frankly out of the pipeline of any other state that we compete with. There's just nowhere near as many projects that involve office development as what we saw pre-pandemic. And I have zero idea when or if those will ever come back because for them to come back, the same way they did pre-pandemic assumes that the, the, the office workplace of today is gonna to go back to something resembling five days a week, eight to five or whatever it was before the pandemic. And I, hard for me to see it going back in that direction. What's that do to the demand for physical office space? 
I mean, any of you who have colleagues in real estate who are doing this office brokerage, I mean, it, it's challenging, especially if you're representing kind of older, outdated class B. We used to be off of Western Parkway. We actually moved to the Wells Fargo building in downtown Raleigh six, six weeks before the pandemic. Great timing. Um, but, but those kind of, like, I think our old building, uh, we just bought it and repurposed it into co-working space, which is a great idea because I think that kind of flexible use is going to be a little bit more successful. But you go out to places like Morrisville, Morrisville has a ton of stuff out there that's multi-story, like where Microsoft used to be, like multi-story, there's no amenities nearby to walk, like those are some of the more challenging office products on the market right now because there's just not a lot of demand. The new stuff that's getting built in downtown Raleigh, downtown Durham, that's that's fine because it's highly amenitized. It's got lots of bells and whistles. What will happen is someone's lease will expire and they want to upgrade to a nicer space so that they can get their employees to come back more often. But what happens to the space that they leave that's older or more kind of less amenitized? That's a real challenge that the office industry is dealing with, not just here with Triangle, but pretty much all over the country. So that is that is one thing we are not likely to see a ton of. A couple exceptions, Odemar Gay in Raleigh, that's the Swiss watchmaker that's setting up a technical center slash there's some office component to that. Uh, Iona, which is a consortium of global automakers that's working on standardizing EV charging platforms. Uh, they, they're gonna do some kind of an office presence, I think, in Durham. Uh, but th those deals have been few and far between. The vast majority of what we're working on today is industrial, uh, especially manufacturing related. Yeah. Any retail? We don't get into retail, so that's one of those things. So we retail, healthcare, a certain <coughs> kinds of commercial is just, uh, they're important, but they're not the kinds of things state groups will work on, right? So we're not trying to get Chick-fil-A to open up another branch in North Carolina. It's just, that's not, like they're gonna make that decision based on a very different set of uh, decisions. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, retail is is outside of my scope of knowledge because at a state level you're not competing for the vast majority of retail development. You're, it's really um, I don't want to say Nordstrom doesn't have some latitude over where it goes, but retailers tend to look very closely at demographic spending data and they're going to put it where where it needs to go. We're dealing with companies that usually have quite a bit more latitude in terms of choosing a manufacturing site in South Carolina versus North Carolina versus Georgia or Texas. That's sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I think this do, guy had a question that was more about here. Do, do all these new jobs drive a lot of population growth and new residents to the state, or do they go like... Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, so it depends. Um, usually if it's manufacturing, the share of the... So when you hear a company announce 500 new jobs, well, it makes a difference. Like, it's not... It's very rarely 500 new people who would now have to come here from somewhere else. If it's manufacturing, the share of those 500 jobs likely to be much more locally hired from. Uh, you might get like 10% of that who are managerial, technical, professional engineering type positions within that manufacturing facility. M many of those might be recruited from outside the community. Not all, but many would be versus the other 450 manufacturing production, they're likely to be, I think the company wants to hire them locally because it's a lot it's, it's very expensive if you're trying to recruit a candidate in from outside the market versus hiring them locally. Now, if it's an office type project, like a corporate headquarters, if they're moving corporate headquarters like what Honeywell did back in 2018 down to Charlotte, the share of those same 500 jobs would be much higher in terms of relocated employees who are coming here from somewhere else. Uh, so that's a great question. Usually in the case of like a corporate headquarters, I think Honeywell, I think they got 60 or 70 percent commitment from employee, which is really good. I mean, it shows you the appeal in North Carolina. Um, you certainly see some relocation situations where they can only get like 30 percent of their people to move, and for the rest of those, they'll try to hire locally or they'll try to recruit from out of market. Uh, but usually, that's those are the, the two opposites of the, the end that we see. Manufacturing tends to be the least share of new residents. Uh, headquarters tends to be the highest share where it's someone coming in new to the state. Uh, one back here, and then here, and here. Are we okay in time? Okay. Hi, Chris. Thanks for coming. Sure. Um, so we used to, at one point, there was like that co-working office space, and now I hear a thing called Spark, which in Morrisville is like co-working scientific innovator. Is that too small of a project for you, but that idea of a place where scientists can come together and create new projects, is that something that you see coming more of? 
Yeah, there's not usually such a thing as too small. I mean, Savannah's part of our business development team, and, and she and her colleagues are out there just trying to find companies that might be in growth mode and ready for a new location at some point down the road. And we, we work with companies that are pledging as few as a dozen jobs to some who are pledging as many as two or 3,000. I'd say what if companies are interested in, in state incentives, there is such a thing as too small because there are actually like program minimums to qualify for those. But no, I, I'd say things like Spark, I mean, that, that represents a way to play up on some of the strengths that the region has in the life sciences industry and provide physical facilities for companies that are trying to innovate in that industry. Um, I, I would say some will occasionally deal with companies like that. Many of them are startups. So startups, like I said, startups have a, quite a few needs that we aren't always gonna be well equipped to solve for them or even point them in the right direction of I'd say the vast majority of who we're dealing with on the business recruitment side, it does tend to be established firms, multinationals, or other large firms that are simply setting up another operation somewhere. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dave. I got a question. I've got three questions. One, um, uh, quickly, what states, maybe the top three states, do you does North Carolina compete with? And two, once you start talking to a company, how long on an average does it take for that company to relocate here? And the third question is, um, what countries uh, are North Carolina companies sort of highlighting to export to? Are there any that come up on your radar? Yeah, sure, all great questions. Um, I'd say our regional neighbors tend to be the most frequent sources of competition, especially Georgia and South Carolina. I'd say Georgia can go toe to toe with North Carolina because they have a similarly very diverse economy like we do. Uh, they also have the benefit of the Atlanta airport, which is a, a major draw for international companies. Uh, Texas will occasionally come up, Ohio will occasionally come up, but most of the time, safely say it's our neighbors here in the Southeast part of the US, especially South Carolina and Georgia, and more so than maybe Tennessee and Virginia. Um, the second question was, uh, your last one was about export markets. What was the second one? How long does like, it take? How long does it take? Yeah. It really depends. Uh, so Nipro Medical, this is the Japanese firm that makes components for the auto injector pump that just announced in Greenville last month. We, our first discussions with them were in 2016 around a different version of the project that they had initially thought they were gonna put outside of Richmond, Virginia. They end up scrapping that version from going back to the drawing board, and so that's why we had a second chance with them starting back in like 2021. And even that, as you can see, that, that took three years almost for that conversation. We have some projects where the fuse is very short. But from the moment we get contacted about it, they may be ready to announce within just a, a few months. We get some that it stretches out a year. If I had to average it, uh, do you have any, any sense what the average? I'd say um, if we had to average, Probably a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, just that's usually the lead time on it. Yeah. I would say is an average. And then uh, in terms of export markets, I, most of the companies that we deal with that help on exports, they are usually new to exporting, and so it's easiest to start in nearby markets like Canada and Mexico, especially because we've got like, good trade agreements in place between the U.S. Um, after that, it's usually like English speaking markets tend to be a little bit easier for companies that are relatively newer to exporting. Uh, and, and after that, it really just depends on the product that we're talking about. Yeah, great questions though. Um, my question is just, what is your um, thought on how it compares with our um, regional neighbors, um, where we can kind of expand and grow, and just your talking points on the strength of our economy now and maybe the Yeah, well, I know this is being video recorded, so there's no way I'm going to say anything, but I think that North Carolina is far better than our regional neighbors. But I, I didn't know you wanted to do, right? Um, you know, I, I'm not from here. I, I don't know. I actually show, I always like to do this, especially in Durant, because it's interesting. How many of you are from North Carolina originally, born and raised? Okay, how many of you moved here at some point in your lives? Yeah, so that, that's not part of the course. Uh, and that, that's one of our, I honestly think, even though it, it probably, it might drive natives in North Carolina crazy from time to time. I honestly think that is one of our greatest strengths is because we've attracted people, like our population and workforce growth is really powered not by, not organically, it's like you, you grow your population two ways. 
you have more births than deaths on a routine enough basis that you start to grow your population, or people move there from somewhere else. And the vast majority of places grow their population by what's called in-migration. That is what North Carolina's story has been going back 40 years. And that is really good because when you can talk about a workforce population that has grown leaps and bounds the way ours has because people move here, and then you can layer on top of the fact that people move here on average at, in, in their early 30s with some amount of college education, that's basically a really great story to tell about workforce availability growth. And that's really what's happened in North Carolina. So I think, if anything, for that reason, we are doing really, really well. Now you can pair that with things like our natural beauty and quality of life and, and all of those things. But for companies that we deal with, the workforce argument is a really powerful one. That kind of allows me to address the other part of your question, which is like long-term fundamentals. I, I think I'm very bullish. I mean, I, I think North, there, there isn't anything that I can foresee that would cause North Carolina to lose momentum when it comes to people wanting to be here. And if people want to continue to be here, it means that some number of businesses will also decide to expand here because they have access to that fast-growing workforce. Short of, I mean, and this is, we are not a political organization, we are not partisan, but you can see where if some <coughs> state out there that was very welcoming to people from everywhere decided to take some steps that made them seem less welcoming, you can see maybe something like that could start to affect it. But short of that, the fundamentals of a strong economy, a good quality of life, I mean, just those two things alone would make me very bullish about North Carolina's long-term success. As I was telling Fred beforehand, we already start from a really advantageous position. Like the public perception of North Carolina in the business community, really, really strong. I mean, any of you who deal with people who are moving here from some other market, you probably also see this show up in individual perceptions of North Carolina. Again, we're not a perfect state, of course, but no state is. But we are tend to be seen as a really nice one, both as a place to live and certainly as a place to do business. Many states don't enjoy either of those two perceptions. We already start off with both of them. Our job as an organization is what are some of the other tweaks and tactics we can put in place that allow us to, to perform at or above where we should be just based on the strength of our product alone. But I'm, I'm very bullish that uh, if we can continue to do our end of things, uh, just North Carolina being an attractive place, we should be having some amount of success for the foreseeable future. Great question. Uh, over here in the middle, and then yeah. up back yeah. the, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I forgot the question. I'm kidding. Um, so, I, and this may, may not be your area of expertise, but so it's great that all these companies are coming here and manufacturing and we're producing all this battery operated and so forth um, product. But what about the infrastructure, like the electricity, the water, uh, roads? Because they're not up to par, in sure, my yeah. opinion. There's problems when we, you know, when it gets too hot, or you know, we don't have enough water. We have to ration. The electricity when it's too hot, we have to ration because we can't all use the AC. So, yeah. do you recruit those companies, or what are you doing? Because it's like a foundation to me. Yeah. Um, well, I'd say uh, the challenges. If North Carolina has challenges that we will have to grapple with, and already are they are challenges of growth. I mean, it kind of goes back to your question, is there such a thing as too much growth? I mean, anybody else who live here in the Triangle, I mean, even just a short 10 years of living here, yeah, you, you, I can definitely see like where, where home values are and what traffic congestion looks like. It's very noticeable even after just a decade. I would argue that it's much better as a place to have problems of growth than problems of stagnation or shrinkage, but they are still challenges nevertheless. And I guess going back to your question, like what can you do individually? Th this is where getting engaged with elected officials and policymakers, like those are the kinds of questions you should be asking of candidates for more local offices is like, what are we doing to ensure that infrastructure keeps up with the pace of growth that I've seen in my community? What can we do to make sure that school sizes keep up with the pace of population growth? What can we do to make sure that housing availability and affordability keep up with all the demand that's coming from people moving here? Those tend to be more local issues that have to be addressed that way. There's a role for state and federal government, but usually a lot of infrastructure, 
housing, schools, it tends to be more of a local governmental decision. And that's kind of the role that all of us have as citizens and residents in this state to, to engage in that process. I don't have an easy answer, right? None of those are easy problems to solve for. Yes, when we get a company that we know is gonna really tax the infrastructure, yes, we absolutely have to ask, are these jobs and investment, is that worth it? Or should we take a pass? And we, we've sometimes had to do that. There's either no place we can put them or it would just be prohibitively expensive to get a site ready. And in those cases, we just have to say, appreciate the opportunity, but we can't, we're, we're not gonna compete. We actually, we took a pass on one a few months ago that just announced this week, and it was simply because that industry was likely to be not well embraced by the community they were interested in. And none of us wants to force that kind of relationship because a company doesn't want to go somewhere where they're not welcome. <clears throat> Uh, that's that's not going to work out long term. So yes, sometimes we just have to decline and compete for some of these opportunities, and sometimes it is spurred by the issues that you bring up. But the, the bigger issue is, as a fast growing state and an even faster growing region here in the Triangle, how do we make sure that infrastructure, housing, schools, <laughs> how can that continue to absorb the people who move here every single day? And there are no easy answers to any of that stuff. I guess we started with you one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Last couple question. Of, couple of questions. <laughs> well, I think we're, we well, might be yeah. at time. So. I know, like, you know, I'll make it really quick. So we talked about international competition and then local competition you know, with other states, right? Within North Carolina, isn't City of Charlotte you know, competing you know, with you know, the Triangle area? And I'm always being an ambassador, and I always say, like, you know, the Triangle area is number one, you know, in the in the country. I know it's not true, but I just lie anyway. Uh, so I'm being a good ambassador for this area, but can I keep lying? You know, can I say, you know, North Carolina is number one, you know, for business? Can I say Triangle is number one for business within North Carolina? It really depends. I like the the two areas don't compete as much as people assume. Um, they are actually fairly different when you when we talk to companies about how they see each of those two markets, Charlotte and the Triangle. Uh, they are perceived to have different relative strengths depending on the, the kinds of companies. Uh, I would say if you're talking something like a Fortune 500 corporate headquarters that's thinking about getting out of New York or Chicago or LA and, and they're looking in North Carolina. On average, Charlotte will get looked at a little bit more closely for that. One, because they already have a pretty good concentration of Fortune 500 corporate headquarters, but that Charlotte airport really can make a difference for a company that wants to be globally connected. Now, our airport does a fantastic job here. I mean, now we've got, what, four or five direct international routes that we can get every day, so four to Europe, and then I think two to Central, uh, Central America, plus Canada, of course. Um, so yeah, I think that's one example. Whereas something like life sciences, if it's pharmaceutical manufacturing, their their triangle is going to shine probably a little bit brighter in that analysis than Charlotte. It doesn't mean they won't look in Charlotte, but again, sometimes you're just dealing with perceptions here. Um, whether or not you can say all those things, there's a lot of metrics out there. Uh, I'm sure some metrics would support like that claim. Um, I know. When you go to the companies and you're pitching in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you say like no, we're number one state for business? Well, if it's true, of course, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and so there's different rankings, right? Like we're number, for two years in a row, we were number one in what we consider the gold standard, which is CNBC does their best states for business ranking. And that is, there, there's other ones, but that one gets the most media attention, which is why we consider it the gold standard. We were number one two consecutive years, 22 and 23. This year, edged out by Virginia by the slimmest of margins. We're, we're number two in the country. Virginia took the top prize. They use like uh, 120 metrics across 10 categories, 2,500 total points, and our margin uh, of, of loss was like three points out of 2,500. That's how close it was. I, when the Olympics were going on, I would tell people that was like losing the 100 meter dash by less than four inches. Like that's how close it was to us tying and being the first ever three peak. But number two in this case means we're still better than 48 other states. So what we'll do rather than say we're number one according to CNBC, we might talk about how well we performed in the different components that make that up. But look, we don't rely solely on the rankings. I mean, the rankings help, but there's a more fundamental story that the rankings basically reflect, and that's what we're gonna focus on when we talk to companies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone coming, and I hope you guys, I hope to see y'all at our um, happy hour that we have in two weeks. Thank you.
No. One week. One week. Oh, one week. Sorry, September the 12th.